legislative process, um, let's just take, let's take a, a good and, and simple example um, from a, a bill that I passed that, and, and it occurred right out here in, on M21. Um, so about, I think it was about four years ago, I'm not sure. You probably remember the incident where there was a, a woman who was on drugs, um, crashed into two boys from Avoca that my son went to school with and, and killed them both. Um, and so uh, what we, as we dug into that situation, because it was, it was heartbreaking, and then as we dug into it, we found out that she had, this was her seventh time of, being, of coming in contact with the police while intoxicated on drugs, drugged driving, okay? Now, the reason that could happen, and all the others were pending, okay? The reason it happened was multiple. Um, the, the toxicology lab was running over a year behind, you know, almost two years behind that processes this. Um, and our laws, you know, if you were, if you were to be pulled over and, and, and accused of drunk driving, okay, um, you know, you, you, after, after you get out, you know, if you're intoxicated, after you get out, you get your driver's license back because you're not guilty yet, right? You're assumed innocent, even though this has happened. Okay, while they're while they're waiting for the toxicology co report to come back, you get your license back, and then when they and they, if they if they say the toxicology shows you were drunk, you know you still get your license back because until you go through trial, you know you haven't committed that crime or been been convicted of that crime. But your but your automatically your information is is entered into the lean system, which is law information something network. Um, and your license is identified uh, plainly that you are in process for that, okay? If you were to be pulled over in the two weeks you're waiting for um, your, your case to go to trial or something, um, immediately the officer would know from lean when they run your license and from when you actually physically show them to them, they're actually clipped, you know, and they can see it. So immediately the officer would know that, that you have a pending case. We, that did not exist for drug driving. In fact, w two of the officers that pulled this woman over previously were married, working for two, two different departments in this area. But of course, you don't discuss the people you pull over right at night, so they didn't even know. Um, so, you know, terrible problem. I mean, from the from the standpoint of the fact that this woman probably could have got intervention help long before, had the system been different, and those two boys would. Well, maybe still be alive because she would never been on a road for two years with seven drug driving incidences. So, so we, so that was a, you know, here's the problem. How do we fix it? Learned way more about that stuff than ever I thought I would. You know, started working with with uh, Prosecutor Wendling, you know, and and Sheriff Donnellan directly. We all we all met on it the next day, the next morning after this happened. We said, how this happen? How can this happen? How do we stop it from happening again? So then you, we go through the process. You start working the prosecutors' association to how how we can fix this, you know, with the Michigan Sheriff's Association, um, because they they have the knowledge and the background. They know how it actually works. I'm not a sheriff. I'm not a prosecutor. I don't know how those things work. Um, from there, you go to the Legislative Service Bureau. So the Legislative Service Bureau is an organization that exists in Lansing for the legislature, um, nonpartisan. They're lawyers, okay, and and they write law. You know, so they would find they would identify the sections of the law that we'd have to change, and all we want to change is say, hey, the drug drunk driving system's working pretty well. You know, this kind of situation doesn't have. I mean, if you get pulled over a second time when you're drunk driving, you don't get your license back. You know, you're you're off to jail until they figure it out and you can be released, but you don't get your license back and until your case is done. You're off the road as as a driver, and so that system was working well. We just said, look, why don't we mirror that same system? with drug, drugged driving as we have with drunk driving. So the Legislative Service Bureau figures out where the points are in the law, the code that has to be changed to make that happen. Um, you, you meet with the people you know, that would have to change the computer system you know, to make that, that information system work and all those things. Um, then finally you have a bill that's brought to you as a member. Um, you can do two things as a member. You can go around with what they call a blue back. So there's a blue piece of paper literally stapled to the back of your bill that would change all those sections of the law necessary to make those changes effect. It has a whole bunch of lines on it. As the sponsor of the bill, you sign it. This bill is sponsored by, and I would write, you know, Daniel V. Lowers, 81st for our district. And then I can go around and, and shop the bills, kind of what we call it, you go around and shop your bill with your colleagues. 
you send emails out tell them, hey, I'm going to have a bill on the floor today at my desk. Um, you know, it addresses the drug driving issue. You know, um, this is something we'd, you know, we want to we want to make the drug driving re reflect drunk driving laws. And you go around and see how many co-sponsors you can get. So you hear about people sponsoring a bill or co-sponsoring a bill. That's that process. The more co-sponsors you can get, the more weight you might say you put behind a bill to get the committee chair to take that up and, and give it the time of day to take it through the committee process. So a bill like that, I got all kinds of co-sponsors for it, both Republican and Democrat, fine with signing it. Then you turn the bill in. It's read in for first reading. That's something we do on the floor uh, while we're in session. And it's assigned to the, you know, the, the bill is assigned to the committee on, you know, committee on justice or the committee on transportation or whatever committee that is. It's assigned to a committee. Your next step is to get the chairman to schedule that committee for a hearing because you've got to get it passed out of committee before it can come back to the floor. So if you've done your homework well and you grease the skids well, and that's, those are the things you learn as you work down there, is that do all this work ahead of time before you start it is what I've learned, and it will go smoothly. The people that just grab a bill, they got a great idea, they introduce the bill themselves, they don't get any co-sponsors, they don't educate their members on it, and then they're begging the chairman to take it up, and the chairman's like, I got lots to do, I don't need to take your bill up. So working it, working it through the system, working with people, making sure everybody understands it ahead of time. You know, I kind of wanted my bills to be people be ready to pass them before they came to the committee than, than after. It just seems to work better that way. Um, so you get it before the committee. People come in and they're for or against it. Um, in the case of my drugged driving bill, we had, we had some people that were against it. Um, they were, it's um, a civil rights thing. Uh, the civil rights people were, some of those groups were against it, uh, like ACLU and stuff like that, because they're saying you can't, an officer can't uh, reasonably determine whether a person's on drugs or not. And it's a real problem for officers. We had lots of officers come in and talk about it. You know, I get this person swerving all over the road, so I, I pull them over, okay? Usually as soon as the window comes down, I know what's going on, right? That's what they say. You can smell it with drugs, you can't. Sometimes, you know, if you're popping pills or something like that, can't smell it. Now, we're not talking about marijuana here. This lady was, that was not the issue. It was pills. So they, they're looking at them and saying, I know this person is under the influence of something, but I don't have the ability to, um, like with alcohol, you know, you can take a, a blood test, a urine test, or a blood, yeah, blood test, and you get your answer pretty quickly. We don't have that today. There's so many different drugs. They're working on it, but that's what the, so, so the civil liberty people were in there saying, until you have that reliable way of doing it, you can't do this. You know, you're violating their rights. Um, and, you know, the officers say, well, and so we had to have officers trained specifically for identifying drugs in a person and, and how to put them through a sobriety check because all that is just reasonable cause. You know what I mean? When, a, when an officer takes you in, pulls you off the road and takes you in, that's just for, they have to have reasonable cause to do that. You still can't actually be charged with the crime until they get that toxicology report back. Even, even for your alcohol, for a, a blood test does not confirm it. They, they do the toxicology or, you know, they have to have this confirmed before they do it. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a process. But anyway, so they were against it. We got through it. There was enough, people weren't voting against it. They was like, yeah, that's true, but, you know, we're sure we can, an officer should at least have the opportunity to decide whether or not he has probable cause, take you in, get your blood sample. And so the other thing we had to do, of course, is fix the toxicology labs, get them to turn things around quicker, and we also made it so that if a person uh, has a second incidence of drug driving, and they, there's a way now that they would know that that person came into the stack of toxicology analysis to be done, they, they would rise immediately to the top, and both of them would be run so that we wouldn't have that instance like, like we had with this one where we had two years and seven in, in the stack and didn't know it. But anyway, through the back to the process, get it out of committee. So it's reported out of committee. Then it comes to the floor of the house. In the house, it's read in for a second time. Okay, second reading in the house floor is where you can make floor amendments. So again, if you've really done your homework, there will be no floor amendments. Okay, if you haven't done your homework and someone's out there that doesn't like what you did in committee, anybody, not just committee members, can come in and propose an amendment, and that has to be voted on. And you'll hear it all the time. If you ever watch us, you know, please watch us when we get back in there because um, I'll only be there for a short while longer. 
um, you know, watch it happen. So you'll hear us in second readings and someone, you know, has an amendment. Sometimes they want to speak to the amendment, you know, and so that's where that happens. And we vote on the amendment. And most of it we do by uh, a voice vote. Some we don't even do voice vote. We just, we just, the chair just calls it. Now, if someone protests that, we go to a recorded vote. Okay, but you hear most of what we do, you know, um, without, ex without objection, you know, so, you know, it's passed. So, they, you know, if someone objects, then we can go to voice vote. If someone objects to voice vote, we can go to recorded vote. The reason we don't do this, it takes, it takes the House about five minutes to do a recorded vote at the fastest. The Senate has a three-minute shot clock. In the Senate, if you don't vote within three minutes, you miss the vote. In the House, we try to be very cordial, and we try to give as much time as it takes for 110 members to finally get in the room and push the button, or we'll close the board, and they can still vote by, by hand. Okay, so, um, and it, so there's many, many votes in the House that go on for 10, 15 minutes because somebody decided to go downstairs and have a smoke because they thought we were going to be a while. Yeah, and then we're all on our cell phones. We're so-and-so, get them up here. We want to, you know, yeah, it happens. Or they get dragged out in the hall, and they're talking to a lobbyist, and you yeah, drag them back in. Um, as the floor leader, that's my job. That's what I do. You know, I'll say, Helen, you go find Representative Hernandez, please. You know, call, somebody call Representative Hernandez, and usually when that happens, they say, oh, his phone's right here on his desk. You know, that's a, kind of, not Shane. Shane's, not a, Shane's a good voter. I'm just using him because you guys know who he is. So, so you get it through the second reading, and then you've got to convince them to take it up for third reading. Third reading is where everybody does the actual recorded vote on every, everything we do. Third reading is recorded vote on everything. If you get a majority, it's reported out of the House and, and sent to the Senate, transmitted to the Senate. Repeat the whole process again in the Senate. Now, you don't have to go out and get co-sponsors and all that. It's just the Senate will take it in, read it through first reading, and they will assign it to a committee. Could be the same committee, should be the same committee if you've done things right. Could be a different committee. If it's a, something that the House or the Senate, depending on which way these bills are moving, never wants to look to again, they send it to a certain committee. You know, government operations is what it's called. Um, if, it's sent, if your bill's sent to government ops, you just got a message that they don't ever want to do it. Um, and so you don't want your bills to go to government ops. And the only people sitting on government ops are myself, um, the Speaker Pro Tem, and the Speaker. So... Um, you know, it's pretty, it's the top three people, you know, you're, it, so if, if, if it's something that we just don't ever want to see again, that's where we send it. Now, that doesn't mean we can't. We've had, I think, three bills this year come out of government ops. Sometimes you'll send them there for different reasons. One reason you'll send it there is because you know that there's something that you're going to have to extract from this person somewhere down the way, maybe. And so you send their bill there, and when they, if they really want it bad, you extract it, or you see if they're willing to make the deal. Um, sometimes we'll send them there because the bill's so upsetting to the other party that um, if we didn't send it to government ops, they're going to start uh, protesting the Capitol, something like that. Uh, we actually had one like that this year that we have put out, and that's uh, uh, English as the official language in Michigan. That's, that went to government ops because we knew it was going to cause a heck of a stink. What does the ops stand for? Government operations. And it's just a catch-all committee that uh, you can send anything to. So, so English as our, as our official language went there. Um, and we held it there for quite a while and then uh, the member that re wanted it really wanted it and we said, well, you know, if you think you can get it out of committee and you can get it through the floor of the house, we'll give you your shot at it. You know, you're willing to take the, the barbs and arrows that are gonna come your way. Uh, we let him and he, and he got it through. Um, the Senate's not moved on it. So auto insurance and ops do? No. <laughs> No, auto, auto insurance is an insurance. Yep. Well, there's been many attempts at it. Um, it's just never, we've never, you know, and, and I think there's, there's obviously there's room, you know, to change that particular issue, but there's strong forces against it. What's the prognosis and, for it? Unless, well, the pressure is certainly building. And so, you know, we've begun discussions with some of the constituencies, you know, the health care providers and the trial lawyers to tell them, the trial lawyers really don't care. We're not so worried about them, but the hospitals, we are. The hospitals are our friend. These health care private, we need them, right? We, we need them there. We need them to good, do good work. So we started meeting with them saying, you know, if, if, if you go too long on this thing, the pressure's going to build where you're going to get a change you don't want. 
You know what I mean? It'll be one of these petition citizens initiative type things like the, the three things we have on the ballot this time. Those things don't go through any of this process. You know, it's not a representative process, it's not a Republican process, you know what I mean? It's just a, it's a, it's a majority vote thing. And how can you, you know, they, they don't take the time to go through the laws and, and go through that process. We do and have all the affected parties come in and say why this is wrong and what should be changed. You know, a lot of times when parties come in and tell you what's wrong and what should be changed, it gets a whole lot better than it was when it started out. You know what I mean? And, and, that, and the party that was against it may never even be a for it, but they made it a whole lot better in that process. They got a lot closer to what they wanted. You know, there's another thing that goes on in Lansing where if it's your job to make sure that you represent the, um, uh, the, the hunting dog breeders, okay? And actually, they're actually lobbyists for individual breeds, but your hunting dog leader lobbyist, uh, breeder lobbyist, um, and you're opposed to, everybody's worried about the slippery slope in Lansing, right? Um, you know, the precedents that might be set. If we change this law, what's coming next? So you would be against this change to laws that affect the breed of, of dogs or using dogs in hunting. Um, and you might improve that bill is what we call it. You know, you, you express what's wrong with it and the bill gets improved, but you're still opposed to it and you're opposed to it all the way through and your members are opposed to it, but it passes. Um, you know, there's, there's such a thing as like you will, you'd never agree to it because you're worried about that slippery slope. You're worried about the precedence, you're worried about the change. Even though it's something you maybe could live with, you just, you know, that happens in Lansing. The other thing that happens in Lansing, and this, the most disheartening thing I've ever learned since I've been there, is when opposing advocates, so people for and against, um, make a deal to scuttle the whole thing. Because they, you know, you bill by hours, some bill by hours, regular lawyers that bill by hours, or or you just got to keep rehiring my firm to protect you, right? To, to fight for you, to protect your interests. So um, I saw that happen my first term down there and it, it was actually over a sanctity of life issue. So it really kind of disappointed me. But so you, you'll see that happen where um, uh, the, the advocates or lobbyists for, for one side of an issue and the advocates or lobbyists for another side of the issue will come together um, usually that nobody ever knows it, um, and say, you know, we solved this thing. You're losing a client. I'm losing a client. Why are we solving this thing? Let's just let it fall apart. You know, that's, that's disheartening when you see that happen. And you really, you really worry about the people that pay those people to work for them. You know? Now, that's an integrity issue, of course, and it depends on the person and the issue and all that stuff, I'm sure. But... But these things happen, you know. It's part of that process. So if you get the House to do it and you get the Senate to do it, Helen, and you get to the governor, um, I just had a bill here in the last month that was vetoed. I did it, went through the whole process, got it all done, bipartisan, everybody supported it. Even got the DEQ to neutral. So if you can get the DEQ to neutral, you have done something, you know what I mean? Because the DEQ is opposed to anything that touches anything. I got them to neutral, and, a, and the governor still vetoed it. So, so you can do it all right, and you can get it all done, and you still gotta, you still gotta get the. So the saying in Lansing is, is uh, what is it? Get the numbers right here. Fifty-six in the house. That's the majority in the house. Um, it's uh, eighteen is thirty-six. So, it's twenty in the Senate. There's 38 in the Senate, so you got to get 20 to get a majority, and one. So you'll hear people say that in Lansing, 56, 20, and one. That's what you got to have to pass a bill, votes-wise. I got way more than the 56 and way more than the 20, but I didn't get the one. And so I'm hoping Shooty wins, and I'll do it over, because I think he'll, Am I he'll vote for it. Right that you see the, that the Senate and the House share the same committee like? No. Sometimes we do joint committees. So Joint Committee on Transportation will meet at certain, so we, we do, when we're, trying to, when we're trying to educate ourselves a lot, you know, it's a big issue, nobody really understands it. We'll do joint committees so we both can get educated at one time. But we have slightly, we have many committees that are the same, we have many committees that are, or a few committees that are slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, it can go either way. There's another thing you can do, and that is, um, 
this is an issue that affects me as a House member. This affects you as a Senate member. And the two of us get together and say, let's do double bluebacks. That's what they call that. So you introduce it in the Senate. I introduce the exact same language in the House at the same time. And we start running, running at it from both ends at the same time. Rather than doing it all here and passing over there, or doing it here, we'll start in both chambers and run to the middle. And that way, you pass it out of the Senate, it comes over to the same House. In the, committee, in the House committee, we said, this is the exact same bill as Representative Lowers had before our committee last month or last week. And so everybody's like, oh, okay, I understand. Okay, pass it out. And then you and I get together and say, okay, who actually gets the bill? Who gets the public act? You know, and then one of you gets it and one of you doesn't. But that will, that will, that will theoretically cut the time in half it takes to, to make a bill sometimes. Not too dissimilar from what we do in budget each, each year. <clears throat> in budget, Senate works on their budget, the House works on their budget, and they come to conference on those two. And, and the governor has his own input because you got to get the, you know, got to get the governor's signature. So there'll be a three-way meeting on budget where we'll say, okay, House, um, House prevails, um, Senate and the governor um, go with the House. And then, you know, the same can happen, you know, Senate and, and the House go with the governor on, and you go through piece by piece and make those deals and make those agreements. Um, so sometimes that's why we'll pass a budget that some people will look at and say, I can't believe you're going to do this. And, and we just try to say, well, just hang with us, you know, kind of like negotiating, you know. Um, just hang with us. We're, it's not going to be so bad as you think. Yes? I want to change the subject, but um, for years everybody has run on the platform that they are against Common Core in the schools. And then for years, nothing has ever been done about it. Can you offer um, an idea of why? I think they, I, I, I'm not as educated in that subject as I need to be to answer that specifically, you know, but because I've never been in education committees. But um, it seems that they have watered it down, but not eliminated it by any stretch. So why? Um, just can't get enough votes. You know. Why do you hear anything? Is it because that we get um, Michigan gets millions of dollars back from the federal government? Is that it, why they're it, not? It could be. Um, I've never heard that pointed out as as the as the no, reason. It's but data mining on the federal no, that's, level. I've heard heard that for quite some time now. Yeah. And they're paying back the state. Um, I don't know how many millions per state just for that. They want to stop the K through 12 and do P through 20. And that's a lot of data that they're yeah. collecting. Yeah. And yet um, our schools are not benefiting our children under the Common Core standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Common Core was, I mean, the way I understand it was pretty much a Trojan horse that was used to, was sold as one idea. Let's, let's make it so you can compare the, the, the way a, a student did in high school in Michigan to how they did in Minnesota. You know, this idea that, you know, wouldn't that be nice? And it was sold that way and people ascribed to it before they realized how, what that was really going to mean at the educational level and, and all that stuff. But you know, I've been one of the people that have co-sponsored the legislation to repeal it. Um, yeah, and it's going to continue for quite some time here until you know. I but well, the educational chair Tim Kelly is your House educational chair. That's that's your first one to talk to. Someone even closer than that to us is Pamela Hornberger. She's number two on that committee. Um, and she's right next door here. You know, she has part of St. Clair County. That's a great person to talk to, um, you know, about, about what's happening with Common Core. Um, you know, you're, you're talking to a guy that wants to eliminate the federal Department of Education. So um, I, you know, I, as it, it, just from my perspective, and I'm just going from when I, I went to a really small school, you know, oh, I'm sorry, and, uh, and uh, you know, the majority of us went to college. Um, I hardly know a classmate. We had 110 or 15 of us in our 
class. We gra I graduated in 1981 from KPAC. I, I hardly know a classmate that's alive today that isn't doing well. You know, um, I mean, we, we had a, I thought we had a good education. I got into Michigan State, barely, but I got in, um, you know, and, and, and did fine there too. It was a big adjustment. I had, you know, I had to study for the first time in my life hard, you know, not just read it and take it. Uh, but um, it seems like since, since we started telling schools what to do instead of letting schools figure out what to do, it hasn't gotten better. Our performance seems to, to be sliding, not, not, not gaining. And, and I guess I don't know. It seems like we, you know, with the, with the teaching to the test and all that stuff, we spend so much time teaching kids what to think. They don't, we don't teach them how to think anymore. Um, and so I, I think the top down isn't really working so well. But, but I'm a real personal responsibility guy. You know, and I, I really believe that um, a, a, a school district, a town, a community ought to be free to make the best school or maybe the worst school in the world if, they, if, that's, what, if that's what they want to do. Because the, the difference I see wherever I go, the biggest difference, the most common thing I see, the difference between a good school and a bad school is the community that is supporting it or not supporting it. The schools that have good community buy-in and good participation from the community, from the parents and from the community, all, all those people together seem to just do, in general, they seem to be the good schools. The schools that don't have a good community parental buy-in doesn't seem to matter what they do, they really struggle to, to, to compete with that other school. So, you know, I'm not sure how much you can, you, you, I know you can't force community buy-in, I know you can't force parental involvement and responsibility. So I don't know how much forcing reporting and testing and all that stuff is necessarily going to cause a, a, a better performance you know, on the, on the education, on the learning level. Uh, there was recently a, uh, a, a Supreme Court decision, uh, uh, Ann Arbor Schools versus the gun owners, essentially. And uh, the Supreme Court sided with the school district and said that the Michigan Financial Law did not cover the schools and that the legislature had to address the, the, the problem in the, in the way the law was written. The, the law was written. Now, I've read, read the law, and I can't see any problem in it, but the Supreme Court did. And two of our Republicans voted with the Democrats on this. Yep. Now, is the legislature going to address that with the, the attorney of the case? Um, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. People were very upset with the what the what the uh, mm -hmm. justices were did it. But you know, if if they read it that way in the law, and and we want r rule of law judges, um, this isn't the first time I've seen this happen where they said, "Listen, you guys wrote the law, and mm -hmm. we're interpreting the law, and, and if and if if that's not the way, pe you know, it's not a judge's job." And it should never be a judge's job mm -hmm. to change the law mm -hmm. to make it work for what you want. You know, so if they don't read it that way and they say change it, it's up to the legislature to change that law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if it needs to be clarified, yeah. that's 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 what you because we're a lot more accountable. <clears throat> you know, what I mean, if we change the law the way you don't like, you you don't vote for us next time we're gone. Um, that's and that, that's the way the republic system was set up. Works pretty good. So um, I've seen. Um, so yes, the answer to your question is yes, the legislature will have to. Will they do that between now and the end of year? Um, I don't know. <clears throat> you know, I mean, it would have to. It would have to go through that process I just described in both houses in the less than 20 days we have left to meet. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> to be completely um, forthright, if if the party in control loses control. They're going to work more than those 15 days. I can, I bet on it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, because they're going to try to, maybe something like that would rise to the top very quickly. Because uh, they, if they're not going to have the votes, if they're not going to be able to do the 56, 20, and one in January, then something like that could become a priority. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very inexact way of answering your question, but yeah. probably the best that's I can. Really yeah, mm -hmm. with something like that. But I've seen, you know. I've run into people that, that absolutely dislike Bill Schuette. And just about every time I run into it, I found it's, it's one of those type situations where as Attorney General or as the uh, Director of Agriculture or something like that, uh, more so in, in the Attorney General's role where, you know, they said, I can't take your case. You know, the law doesn't allow me to, to take your case. But I want, and everyone else has told me that, everyone else is not giving me the answer I want. I want you as Attorney General to give me the answer I want. You know, and he's like, I can't. That's not what the law allows me to do. 
the law is wrong. I mean, I've heard him make those rulings. The law is probably wrong for from any person with common sense or good judgment would agree with you that that law is wrong and you need to take it to the legislature and get them to change it. Um, you know, that does, does happen. It's really hard to make laws accurate. You know, that's something that, that that's why fewer laws is better. Uh, the, you know, I've never looked for how many bills I can pass because generally when we pass something, I mean, I'm all for the bills that we pass that are that are making your life freer and easier and making you more responsible for your decisions and you live with it. Um, I'm, I'm really reluctant to <coughs> add those hurdles because usually what happens is you can just about take any situation where people are misbehaving and it's how, what percentage of the population is doing this. You know what I mean? I mean, some, some of these situations can be horrific or awful or whatever it is, you know, child abuse, all kinds of, you know, the awful things, right? So we lay, a, we lay a layer of regulation or, or law on top of people on everybody in the room, right? You all get it, right? There's one person in the room, um, you know, gun laws are a good example of it, right? I mean, we've got to prevent this from happening again. Look at this awful thing. Well, the person broke the law, you know, or the person obviously went outside the law because they use a, a weapon in a, in a you know, uh, in a, a illegal way, um, but we lay a whole other law on top that means <clears throat> all the law-abiding people who were doing things right in the first place that were never really planning on doing anything wrong got to comply and jump through that hoop, right? We do those businesses all the time to make sure this never happens again. We make the 95 or more percent of the people that were living right, doing it right, never planning to do it wrong, comply and go through it to try and identify the maybe the, the 5 percent or less that were that are ever doing it wrong or we're simply just breaking the law, right? I mean, if, if, they're, if you're, if you're going to do something that's illegal in the first place, making it more illegal doesn't usually change behavior, but, but we are guilty in the legislature, in politics, of, of doing that more than once, right? Statutory laws are, well, are called now a prohibitum for nothing. Right. <laughs> right. Dan, so. we had a list of some of the stuff presented in the legislators, by some of the legislators, like the uh, state lor poet, laureate yeah. poet, uh, how fast do they die? I mean, this is sort of a... How fast do those bills die? Yeah. Um, a lot of bills are introduced for show. Yeah. Okay. So are they sort of... I don't think I've ever introduced a bill for show yet, but, <laughs> but a lot of them are, okay? They're just introduced for show. I mean... Um, as, as the floor leader, I get every single bill that's introduced every single day, and I read them. I don't read the whole bill. Don't get any ideas that, I mean, you're, you know what I mean? There's 23 bills introduced in any given day or, or more. I just read who the sponsor is, who the co-sponsors are, what part of the law they're affecting, and, and, the, and the one or two or three paragraphs they give that describe it, Okay. Um, after you've been there for a while, I almost have, don't have to get much past who, who sponsored and who co-sponsored to know whether I need to go any further, right? So, um, I mean, just given the topic and given the personalities and knowing where the person's position is, it's never going to become law anyway. It was introduced for show, you know. So the, you know, the, the person that introduces 14 laws in one day requiring more stringent uh, testing on water, you know, you know. I know what's being done for show. He's just doing it for his constituents. Right. Yeah. His or her constituents. They're doing it for so they can go home and say, "Listen, I'm with you. I've done." You know, mm -hmm. doesn't sound much different than me saying I co-sponsored the the uh, Common Core repeal, but that one's in earnest, and you know we've made efforts at it. But you know what I mean? It's, I mean, you, you do what you can, and some people the only thing they can do, especially if they're in the minority, is introduce bills for show. To go back home and say, I'm, I'm working for you. I'm fighting for you. This is what I've done. Um, now, if, if their constituency was more educated and they said, well, how are you going to make that happen? You know, they'd have to try and answer that, I guess. And I'm not picking on the minority. There's been plenty of people in the minority pass, pass good legislation, come up with good ideas. You know, um, the smart ones will go to someone in the majority and say, hey, let's do this together, and it gets done. How much of an impediment is uh, term limits on your job? Well, on, on, for me personally, I don't see it as an impediment at all, okay? Mm -hmm. But I am 
one of the old legislators. Believe it or not, I hate to say it, I'm 55, but um, I'm not just talking age old, I'm talking career old. Okay, because of, our, because of our term limits, we are seeing our legislator grow young very rapidly. That's a function of term limits, okay? Um, because you're only gonna have this job for six years and any of the jobs you've had in your life, if someone told you, I don't care how good you are, and probably for that matter how bad you are, but if you're really bad as a legislator, you do get let go. But I don't care how good you are, you could be the very best in this company, you are never gonna serve here more than six years. Lifetime, right? Is that a good use of your career? And now if you're a young person and you're building your career, right? You're building, you're walking up that ladder or however you wanna think of it, um, not a bad, not a bad decision, right? Oh, and there's a price cap too. The wage is this, it was set in, in 2010 and it's never gonna change. Um, you won't ever get a raise, you know, it doesn't matter how good you do, you will never get a raise, you know. That was part of the interesting conversation when I asked my wife if I could serve eight more years. She said, well, you get paid more in the Senate, right? And I said, no, honey, <laughs> same wage we're gonna have for 14 years, okay. Um, but, you know, so that's what's causing the legislator to get younger. Because you can't ever stay and you have to move on. Now, I started, I, I turned, I was 49 when I got elected, I was 50 when I started to serve, as soon as I started to serve, and I had done the math. You know, and I built a company and I, I thought, I honestly thought I was gonna be able to continue to run my company and serve where I never would have done it. And people hear that, they think, oh my gosh. But it's true. If I had known that I would have to leave my company completely in order to, to serve properly, I would have never done it. I thought the legislature meets Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They start at nine, they're done at three. What kind of a job is that? I can do that and do what I'm doing. And I did both for two for one full year, and then I was so tired that my wife and my employees said, "You got to stop. You got to pick one or the other. We don't care which one you do, but pick one because you're ornery, you're not sleeping." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm, it was bad. I didn't realize how tired I was." But yeah. yes, sir. Isn't it? Uh, isn't the idea in this country to have uh, at least on a national level uh, people that would come in and for a short period of time? Serve. Yep. And I would assume that would be applicable to the states. So, I mean, it is what it is. That's the way that the, our founders set yep. it up. So, I mean, if you want to, if, if that's what people complain about, career right. politicians now, may, that may loan itself to only having people that are well skilled. I don't know that. Uh, to run uh, because who, who in the hell could have ever. Yeah, that certainly, on the national level, you really see that playing out more and more all the time. Well healed. I mean, you've got to be able to just about self-finance, and, and I know we all pay our congressmen and senators too much, but most of them can't afford to live out there and maintain their residence here, so it's not, you know, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's not. Sleep in our yeah, sleeping in our office and all that stuff. We have people in Lansing sleeping in our office because they can't afford, you know. But isn't that the way it was supposed to be? It was a superficial well, thing. I, I, think, I think you're right in the idea behind it, but I also think we were supposed to elect them out when we didn't like them anymore. That's why they come up, so that's why the house is up every two years and the state Senate's up four and the, and the federal Senate's up six. The idea there was supposed to be, you know, the House is responsive, you're up next year, remember? You know, that's, I mean, that's supposed to be the idea behind the House is you're up next year, so you, you're listening to me or you're out. Um, people were dissatisfied that incumbency seemed to make people unbeatable, and so we passed these term limits. I asked Gary Randall, the clerk who's been there uh, since the 70s, served and became clerk, um, the other day we had a low spot and we're up, we're up in the front of the podium, you know, that's where my desk is and so up there the clerk and we had a, a low. So I just asked him, I said, Clerk Randall, what, is, what are those doors up there in the balcony back in that corner? And he started laughing at me. He says, well, Representative Lowers, you're living proof that you guys are term limited out before you know where all the bathrooms are. That's a, that's a lady's bathroom. I never knew. I have, I have not been in every door in the Capitol yet, not even close. So you um, think the founders were wrong? I don't, well, the founders didn't put term limits in place. We did that as a people, so I don't know where you want to draw those lines, but um, I don't, yeah, we just, that was a citizen's initiative that we passed as a state here only a few, few years ago. Never done it on the national level. Yes, yeah. Yes. That it gravitated yeah. towards what do we do with yeah. these guys? If a third of the people that are eligible to vote vote, it's a big deal. 
You know what I mean? National level, there's term limits. These guys are in forever. So there's no because of the apathy of the voter, right. the complacency or apathy of the voter, really. I mean, less never, less than a third of the people elect everybody. And Jefferson Adams never right. envisioned right. that it would be. When I ran the first time, I was shocked. Okay, representing ninety thousand people, only got to worry about thirty. Because 60,000 of them had never voted in the last 12 years. So I'm not going to waste the time knocking on their door. You know, when I came to your door, when I come to your door, when, you know, I know how often you voted, okay? And the more often you vote, the more likely I'm going to come to your door. You know, if you're a once every four year or six year or something like that, you're not as high on my list as if, if you're a person that votes every two years, I'm knocking on your door because you're a voter. Why would I knock on the door if someone's not even registered to vote? You know, that's, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> that's, see, you should have got a better list. But that is the, that's the problem there. Now, right or wrong, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I still, you, you know, I, I didn't vote for term limits because I always thought that was our responsibility. I can see good that's come from, no doubt. I, I can tell everybody, you know, I would not be serving a day probably if, it was, if we didn't have term limits, right? I don't think the ever opportunity would ever been brought to me to serve if, I, if there weren't term limits. All I'm saying is they might, they might be a little too short because you're, you're going to get people, you're going to get a lot more people running for office that are building their career than are ending their careers, right? And I knew when I went in, you know, that, that I was, had my business at a point where it was safe and could run without me there every minute, you know, so I could take my eyes off it enough and, and serve, you know, didn't think I was going to live on it, was serve. You know, and do both. Um, once I got in, I got you know, I kind of got hooked at it, and I didn't want to be the guy who quit. <laughs> you know, so um, now that I now that I feel like I can be halfway effective, you know, that's why I'm seeking the Senate because now I feel like I I kind of understand how it works. You know, and it, it doesn't work much different than raising your family or, or managing your employees, really. You know, in the end, people are people. You know, they want to be respected, they want to be heard. If you inform them and educate them ahead of time. And let them, if you're right, if you're probably right, they probably come to the same or similar solution or conclusion that you did. You know, I looked at sales when I did sales. I always thought the same way. I don't have to sell you anything. All I got to do is explain to you, you know, if this is right for you, you'll buy it, right? If it helps you, you'll buy it. And, and it's, the, it's the same in the legislature. It's a, it works, operates a little bit differently, but it's all still the same. People are still just people, you know, and and they all kind of want the same things and they all kind of operate about the same way. And, and so um, I'm not exceptional down there by any stretch of the means, but I seem to have figured that out better than maybe some, you know. So um, some people flail around a little bit and can't understand why the world doesn't, you know, if, if they would just do it their way, it would be all set. And, you know, we all think that way, right, at some, at some level, right? <laughs> right. When we get Helen elected, then they'll, they'll actually just say, let's go to the, the monarchy and let her do it. But, but uh, you know, that's not the way it works. Uh, so, you know, term limits, I, I, think, I think, you know, we probably should make them a little longer. Um, you know, I'm okay with the idea of a part-time legislator because I, I would be fine with that, you know what I mean? But there's not a lot of people who have an occupation that that would suit very well. You know, I mean, I think if we, I think if we went to part-time legislature, we'd see a lot more lawyers serving. Uh, we'd also see people who have bu businesses large enough to say, you know what, you go do it, Grant. Don't you worry about your job. We'll pay you. We'll pay you while you're serving. We want you there. I think it would. You know what I mean? I, 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 I can see some things that that uh, part-time legislature would have some problems. And the biggest problem would have, from what I see in Lansing today is that term limits have put the bureaucracy in, in firmer control of our government. We're the only people, and I, and I say to people, hey, when you have a problem with the government, who do you call? Well, you know, I call the department that's giving me the problem, right? Yeah, and, and how's that work out for you? I meet f frustrated constituents all the time that finally call me because they're so frustrated, and it's like, bang, bang, fix it for them. You know what I mean? We can cut through that red tape because they hate those departments hate it when when Representative Lauer's office calls and says, listen, I don't understand. This person's been working on this for two months, for six months, for what, you know, what, what's the holdup? Well, well it's, just a, it's, just a, it's just a, yeah, and it's fixed. It's done. You know, and, and whether the person gets the answer they want or not, they don't care because they just want the answer. I mean, they do care, but, you know, for a lot of us, 
getting the decision is, is almost as important as getting the decision we wanted because then we can move on. But so if our problem is with usually with the regulatory environment of some level with the with the state, do you want to have less representation or more representation? We're the only ones that are, you don't hire them. You, you don't vote them in the office. You know, you vote us in the office and you hold us accountable. We hold them accountable. So that's that's the one danger we run there too by, you know, I say if, if we go to, if we go to part-time legislature with terms like we have today, we might as well just give them the keys <laughs> because they're already running it, you know, you know, almost regardless of what we think and do. Look at Shane's interaction with DOT on selling those planes. I mean, they just ignore it. Just keep going. Just keep going, you know. Um, that's, I mean, I've, the same person that's ignoring him on that is the same person who sat across my desk my first year and gave me the look of, young man, you're only going to be here six years. I will outlive you, you know. And I could see it. I thought, oh, my gosh, he, you know, because I can't fire him, you know. Governor could, but he's a little bit, he was the director of, you know, the director of transportation and a little bit harder to get at, a little bit harder to hold accountable, as you can see from Shane's dealings with, with him on, on trying to get these planes sold, you know. Um, Are if you, you talking about um, ending term limits or going People talk about it all the time. I don't, I don't see it happening. I don't, I don't see how you could... Um, I don't see how you could have that, we could have that vote. You know what I mean? It would, see, it would sound completely self-serving. And, and people have, I mean, I, there are people in Lansing talk about it. You know, they talk about, we've we got to change this. And we hear the people come in and say, I said, okay, so uh, as long as you're prepared for this, um, 12 to 14 years from now, it will take effect. You know what I mean? That's what it would take, right? I mean, we would have to pass it in such a way that says none of us could ever benefit from it, right? Otherwise, it would be purely self-serving. If I voted for something that says I should be able to remain a senator for another term, I'm going to get beat to death on that, right? Got a lot of public opinion. That is my case, is what you're yeah, but again, public isn't. Uh, I don't. I think. I mean, I think that's how term limits passed in the first place. Public is going to. Public doesn't understand all this stuff. You know what I mean? They don't understand how the bureaucracy is entrenched, they don't understand how the, when, when you're depending on the lobbyists to have the institutional memory, um, you know, the, 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 you know, that's, I don't know that that's the best situation, you know, so, um, you know, I remember when I served for, for Schutte in, in, in DC and there are no term limits, we were doing the 85 Farm Bill and there's this older gentleman, uh, John, I'm trying to remember John's last name, and it was like Hogan or something like that, but he was on the Ag Committee. He was counsel, you know, so he's a lawyer, um, served on Ag Committee as staff. And we're going through this stuff, and we're, we're like, well, what about this? And John says, well, we, we tried that in 1977. Here's how it worked out. Bad idea. Well, what, what about this? We tried that in 65. It's, 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 you know, what, I mean, that was, you know, what a wonderful thing to have a person on staff with that kind of institutional memory. Uh, we don't have that in Lansing either because, because we don't want to pay any more for government than we want to, right? I mean, than we have to. So pe most people can get a better job. If you're, you know, we got people working there that are, that are most of the people working on staff there are Cracker Jacks. You know, I mean, they are good. And a lot of them got law degrees. And after a few years working for the Michigan House of Representatives, somebody, you know, pays them probably more what they're worth. And so that's turning over all the time. The members are turning over all the time. One of the things we counsel new members on is get, a, get an experienced staff person. You know, whatever you do, don't bring the kid that helped you get elected to Lansing because he knows nothing about, she knows nothing about how things operate there. Get someone who has been there and has served for a member that, that just got retired, right? Just got uh, hit, hit their term limits so they know how it operates to help you get up to speed because you only got six years and you're done. Um, you know, I used to say with salesmen, that uh, it took me three years to make money on a salesperson. And people said, oh, my God. Well, the first year, the salesman cost me money. The second year, if the salesman ain't good, they broke even. Third year, they made me back the money that cost me the first year. So the fourth year, I actually made some money on a salesperson. And I don't know how applicable that is to the legislature, but there's a certain amount of that happens in all of our occupations, you know, where we probably don't, we probably don't perform up to, to the point of profit 
our first year, we, we might do that the second, we might break even the second year. And the third year, we probably make up for the deficit we caused the situation the first year. So the fourth year, we're actually worth something. And then you're, then you got one more term. And I can, I can relate to that in, in the house. You know, it was in my, it was in my, my uh, fourth year that I was sitting there uh, actually with Tom Leonard, who's a speaker now. And I'm the lawyer and he's a speaker. We're the front two guys in the front. And I, I leaned over and I said, you know, who the heck's going to run this place next term? You know, we're looking around at our colleagues and going, who's going to run this place? You know, can't be that person. Can't be that person. You know, and next thing you know, we're looking at each other going, oh, cripes. You know, <laughs> we're going to have to do something about this. You know, and next thing you know, you end up running it. Um, so it took me four years to get to that point because you got to get a little bit of confidence, a little bit of understanding. You know, I'm, I believe you should sit there and keep your mouth shut. For the first two years, it's pretty much what I did. Um, so, yes, sir. Another we should question. we should probably finish uh, this up. The Constitution, the state constitution, says that uh, the uh, uh, for the three branches, you can only serve in one branch at a time, and you can't cross over. Now, if lawyers are officers of the court, how can they serve in the legislature or the or the, the governor's office? That's a good question. We got a lot of lawyers serving. I mean, yeah. They like that work too. When a lawyer gets it figured out, they are, they're dangerous. Is there, do you know if there's a law or something that makes it available? I don't know. That would probably take a ruling, you know, to. It's overlooked. Yeah. Taken yeah. Granted. Yeah. I think so. You'd probably scream. All lawyers can't serve. Absolutely. Yeah. So, it, one last question, then we should wrap it up. Oh, the uh, trade, yeah. the trade agreement. I, I'm very excited about. It. We've had a hundred and either 54 or 84 dairy farms go out in the state this year alone. Is that um, out pardon? Yes, out of business, done, gone. Um, that that's a problem in and of itself. But normally, when a dairy farm goes out of business, um, they take they start taking other businesses out with them. Not because they didn't pay them, but because they're such a uh, economic generator in a community. Um, for the people that sell them their supplies, uh, keep their things running, the amount of electricity and just all kinds, you know what I mean, the banks, the, air, the implement dealers. There's, when you start losing your productive businesses, remember farms are one of the few, th few businesses that actually produce something new. You know, they create new money. That's one of the things I've always loved about being involved in farming. We actually create movement. We don't take, we don't take this chunk and change this chunk into something more valuable, a smaller chunk. Right, like a lot of manufacturing does, we actually create it out of sun, soil, and air, and you know, and new. So, I mean, here's here's a here's 200 bushels of corn that didn't exist before, and that and that value is new, introduced to the community, and then it then it gets to move around and do all those other things that manufacturing and processing do, right? But farming is one of those magic things where you actually produce. Kind of like having babies, you know. What I mean, here it is. It didn't exist before, and now it's here, and it can have an economic impact. I mean, so yeah, that it's sad to see those dairy farms go out. This new trade agreement should affect that. You know, it couldn't come soon enough. It'll be good. Excellent. It'll be really good. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why they come here and buy it, right? I mean, that's the one effect of this: is our milk sales may go down to Sarnia. You know, because the, we see the people come over. If you're in Myers and you see somebody with a whole cart full of gallon milks, so you, you can bet they're from Ontario because it's unbelievable. But isn't it also unbelievable that you can buy a gallon of milk for a third of the cost of a gallon of gasoline? Mm -hmm. yeah, how, you know, how, many, how many gallons? I mean, most, most farms buy gasoline by the tanker load or f diesel fuel, really. Mm -hmm. You know, we did growing up. You know, we bought it by the, by the semi-tanker load because it was cheaper. You know, it's nothing like buying 10,000 gallons of fuel at a time. But, you know, to, it's amazing to me that you can produce a, a gallon of milk for a buck, you basically. Really can. Well, you really can't, not for a long term. And, and dairy farmers have been bleeding for about four years now. Um, so good thing I didn't become a dairy farmer like I was planning, huh? <laughs> years ago, though, didn't the farmer actually affect 19 people's jobs? Because they, were, they weren't so mechanized then. And oh yeah. Understanding too into yeah. what they did, it filtered down to other businesses, yeah. and they actually were the ones that supplied the work indirectly 
like the 19 feet. Yeah, yeah, we don't talk about that anymore. We talk about how many people we feed now. Each, each farmer feeds 70 some people now or something like that. But um, I, there's, believe me, any, anybody that talks about going back to the good old days never worked in them, you know, because, <laughs> well, you know, I don't want to go back there. You know what I mean? There was a lot of, their mechanization has been good for farming. It's been good for the quality of food and the quantity of food that we have today, all those things. I mean, you know, there's a, I've seen the, a, a little movie video that was put together about the good old days in farming and showing, you know, I mean, how small the yeah mom and pop kettle and how small the chickens were and how small the pigs were and 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 how much more unsafe our food was. I mean, people still worry about trichinosis, right? Mm-hmm. Probably shouldn't, you know. I mean, I don't tell you you don't have to, but I don't overcook my pork. I'll tell you what, I was raised on those crusty dry pork chops, <laughs> and I like my pork this thick, and I make sure it's still pink in the middle, because because I know the science of it, and I'm not worried about it. <laughs> That stuff hasn't been around a long time, you know. <laughs> let it rest; it'll come together just right, just like any other meat. So I want to cut you off. Help! I I should any be done. Any more questions? I'm sure you're kind of tired, and I'd like to tell everyone that next Thursday it's going to be our own Ron Bircham. He's going to talk about jury nullification, and then the week after that, Tim Keller finishes his third session on the government. Very good. So. Well, thank you. Thanks.